Okay, hey, good to see all y'all, figuratively speaking. Hope you're sitting there, uh, you know, feeling all studious and stuff. Got your book open in front of you, page 187, just one chapter tonight. Butte 11 Real Estate Contracts, and it's, you know, we said last night, this is one of the three biggies, so now we've covered two of the three biggies. The third biggie is our very next class after the midterm. Uh, a bonus for you guys. We do give uh, three points to every student for margin of error. It's just a fact. You know, we order these exams from somebody else, but there's errors in life. So we give you the benefit of a doubt, whether there is or not, you get three points. I told you we're going to send you. Uh, oh, yeah. i got to make an announcement. You know, we're going through some changes, trying to make everything more easily readable. Readable. Y'all, I had a couple of cocktails a minute ago. The portal on the website. Uh, we are not going to send out the Friday recaps any longer. We've been doing that for a number of years. It's a headache with the spam filter. So we have just made everything available on the portal. If you'll visit the portal, uh, first of all, you signed in at one time. But if you have forgotten from one of the previous emails, you can just do the forgot password and do it again. But when you go to the portal, you can see the recorded sessions of previous classes. If you'd like to view them again, you can pull off various forms and you, there's a place where you can go view all of the recaps. All right. A library of them, if you will. So on page 187, let's go ahead and get cranked up. I'm ready to go home. Our learning objectives, we're going to describe the essential elements of a contract going to explain the various means by which a contract may be enforced, terminated, assigned, and replaced. And then we'll talk about the primary written agreements that we use in the industry. So we turn the page. Uh, huge subject. Interesting subject. If you had business law in college, then you've had a lot of this subject tonight. Business law, I always thought was a quality class. It was kind of sophomore level, but touched a lot of basics that people need to know. And a contract was one of them. It's where I first learned about a contract. Um, a contract says there at the top is a voluntary agreement or a promise between legally competent parties supported by legal consideration to either perform or refrain from some legal act. Now, that's the definition we're going to elaborate on for the rest of the night. That is the definition of a legal agreement. You see a bulleted list of that sentence below. And in fact, I'm not going to sit there and go over these individual bullets now as they are spread out throughout the chapter. But as we move down the page, you see express and implied contracts. Again, guys, this is very theoretical stuff. Like, yeah, sure, I'm a homo sapien, you know, but we don't go around calling people that. We don't go around calling contracts, express contracts, implied contracts. So we're just in a theoretical mode of your career. You know, it's just a path, uh, stone on your path. And an express contract is fairly elementary, pretty simple. Uh, it's where both parties either express verbally or in writing the agreement. I could look at a young man and say, young man, I'll give you $60 if you cut my yard. He says, sir, that's a fair price. I accept. That is an expressed agreement, whether we said it out loud or whether it was in writing. An implied contract, I might be standing in front of my yard and there's five young, able-bodied men. And I look at all five of them. I say, whichever one of you is agreeable to $60 for cutting my yard, that's who I'm going to pay. One of them doesn't say a damn word, but steps up, cranks it up, and begins cutting lines. It's really that simple. Implied contracts, honestly, is something you don't want to hear. More often than not, it's in a court of law and a judge is saying, Mr. Yarbrough, whether you intended that to be the agreement or not, your actions indicated that you agree. Therefore, I'm going to suggest we got an implied contract here. So that's kind of why you don't want to really ever hear implied contracts. You know, I'll give you a, for example, maybe me and you are at halftime at a ball game party out in the back drinking Red Bull and vodka. And you say, you know, I think I'm selling my pickup truck. And I go, holy hell, I have always admired your truck. In fact, I need me a little truck to go get stuff and tote stuff around. He says, 
You think 6000 is a fair price? I said, I'll tell you what, I'll give you 6100 If you get it detailed on Monday, I'll be there with a cashier's check on Tuesday. So he does, he gets it detailed. And on Tuesday, I show up. And first of all, we shook hands at the party and there were witnesses. But on Tuesday, I show up with a cashier's check and he goes, you know, Mark, I hope you're not mad at me, but I think I've changed my mind. I mean, after I got her detailed, I fell back in love with her. Look at her. And I say, you know, I hate to say this means a lot to me, but so we go to court. A, I do got witnesses, but B, what would be the kicker was him going to get it detailed. That was when the judge would say, sir, <laughs> that action alone indicated there was an agreement on your part, whether there was a witness here on behalf of Mark or not. So that's kind of why you don't want to ever hear implied contracts. So bottom of the page, bilateral and unilateral. We as students, we just want to be concerned with the prefix. The prefix is indicating the number of promises in the particular agreement. We all know that by means two, unit means one. So a bilateral contract is a promise for a promise. Unilateral contract, one promise. Um, my gosh, guys, there's a million kinds of contracts, but since we're in real estate class, a real estate contract purchase agreement, two promises are, Promise of the purchasers to show up on a day we call closing with X number of dollars. Promise of the seller is to show up on the same day with marketable title. Promise for a promise. Uh, an example for a unilateral contract might be an option. Uh, think of an option, if you don't know about it, as a placeholder. Um, let's say I see... 60 acres of industrially zoned property for sale out in clear off highway 25 and i'm picturing an industrial part you know um some distribution warehouses get some 30-year leases up in there and um they want 4.7 million dollars for it i ain't got that kind of money but i do have three friends and the four of us have a partnership so I ask them if they want to get involved. They say, Mark, you're the real estate guy in our gang. If you say so, we, we we say so. I say, okay, go to your CPAs, get all your financials. Let's meet here Wednesday for a bite to eat, cup of coffee, and then we'll go to the mortgage company. Give them a couple of days to crunch the numbers. So that takes about a week, and the lenders finally give us the thumbs up. So I go back to the property to make an offer on it, and I'll be damned if there's not a sold sign diagonally through the for sale sign. Son of a gun. While I was over here handling my due diligence, if you've ever heard that, the property got pulled out from under me like a rug. So the way you could utilize an option, which is a unilateral contract, is I could approach the owner and say, kind sir. Might you be willing to take X dollars and take the property off the market for X days? I say X because the terms are negotiable. Uh, I'll give you some. I, I give you, sir. Would you take five grand and take it off the market for thirty days? He says that's fair. Um, in this situation, this is a unilateral contract. The owner of the property would be the optioneer. I am the optionee, and of the two of us. The owner is the one making the promise. I'm not making a promise. Hell, that's why we call it an option. I may buy the property. I may decide not to buy the property. I just want to tie it up so that it's available for when I perhaps go see if I can get some zoning subclassifications, some uh, building permits, some zoning permits, financing, etc. I want the property to be available once I've done this. Now, before I move on, I want you to understand, even though we're not talking about options, literally, is that that $5,000 in my example is not a deposit. So it's not refundable if I decide not to buy it. That's money I lose. It's money I paid to tie up the property. Page 189, middle of the page. Nerds, you know, who come up with all this stuff, could have hung their hat on any word they wanted to that described the fulfillment of an agreement. Who knows how they arrive at what words they arrive at, but they arrived at execute. So to fulfill your end of an arrangement, you are said to have executed a contract. 
Now, I may see you in Publix, and we start some small talk, and I say, uh, you know, you having a good month? And you say, Mark, I got four pending contracts. I'm having a pretty good month. We all know, because we're regular people, we all know what a pending contract is, don't we? An offer and acceptance, and a contract was created, and then we set a closing date to take place 30 to 60 days later, because there's stuff that needs to be done. Buyers got to make application for the mortgage, appraisal, home inspection, etc. Now, me and you, again, we're regular people. We say pending. Nerds, look in the middle of the page, would say that's an exigatory. Think of exigatory as the present tense of the verb executing. Okay, so if you need to, gang, write the word pending above the word exigatory. Help your damn self out. You ain't going to remember this outside of class. Bottom of page 189. So we're going to kind of go. Over the ingredients of a contract. You know, when you read a textbook, it'll say there are certain necessary elements uh, in a valid contract. Um, I'm country. And I think of a recipe, and I think of a recipe has to have and have a certain number of ingredients. Am I stumbling over my words? Am I doing good? Uh, it's a battle. I think of the ingredients. My, my affliction comes to a dead halt. The ingredients. So let's go over them. Find yourself some paper to write on. I don't know if you take notes. I did in a textbook. So find you some white space. We're going to bullet the individual ingredients to a contract. You're going to need to know them. I'll give you a, an example of a test question that would uh, reveal how they're going to ask you this. But the first ingredient is at the bottom of the page. Don't write off an acceptance. Look at the italicized two words in that paragraph. Highlight it. It says mutual assent. Uh, mutual assent. We know what the words mutual means, both parties, willingly. Assent is to agree, like to dissent is to disagree. So mutual assent. Now, um, I told y'all I get feedback from students and they give me a heads up on things they see on the test. Uh, that there's a question on the exam that says, what's another way of saying mutual assent? Offered acceptance. No, 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 no. Meeting of the minds. You see it further down the same line. Gosh, I'm glad I changed my mind on that. Yeah. It is meeting of the minds. So mutual assent, the nerd version of meeting of the minds. First ingredient. Let's turn the page. There's a lot of good words for you to read right there. I hope you are not uh, going past all this stuff because I do. I'm not going to read to you like a third grader. The bottom of the page, pardon? Oh, yeah. In the same line that you uh, highlighted meeting of the, I mean, mutual assent. Go a little further down the line. You see meeting of the minds? Yeah, that's all right. Next page, consideration. as a second ingredient. Every contract has to have consideration. Weird word but it means basically tit for tat. If I'm doing something for you in an agreement, you gotta be doing something for me. Like in the landscape example, I'm paying the young man $60. He's providing the service of cutting my lawn. Tit for tat. My consideration is the $60. Their consideration is the cutting of the lawn. Now the book is mistaken. Um, that, I say that carefully because it sounds like I'm calling the author of the book dumb, but I'm not. There are, and I want you to write this in the left-hand margin because you will need to know it on the exam. There are two types of consideration. Uh, the first bullet would be called valuable consideration. Again, you can't highlight this. They don't explain it in the book like I'm about to. The second type of consideration is called good consideration. So valuable consideration more often than not is money, but it is anything that both parties agree to of having a value. Uh, my buddy, 
may be willing to do my deck because uh, maybe he's that's a, a skill of his. I need a new deck. It's 20 years old. He's willing to put me a new deck on. So uh, he's willing to exchange the cost of labor. In other words, just charge me for the materials. He's willing to exchange the cost of labor in exchange for the fact that I'm a grease monkey. I fix transmissions for a living and his family car needs transmission work. So there's no cash involved, but both things we agree to as having a certain value, whether it be personal property, a service or actual cash. Good consideration is love and affection. You know, maybe I want to give my daughter some real estate. Maybe we're going to do things above board and record wise and do it contractually. And the courts begin to have to rethink this requirement of valuable consideration because they said, how can someone give somebody something if the courts require valuable consideration? So they said in instances of immediate family, good consideration suffices. So I would be giving my daughter real estate in exchange for love and affection a father would receive from their daughter. At the top of page 191, we're going to the third ingredient. And in fact, you need to write a word above consent. And the word is genuine. And continue writing to the right of the word consent, put free from duress. Free from duress. In other words, the agreement has to be legitimate, not forced. What if I'm a small business owner and my secretary, God bless her, she ain't got a pot to pee in or a window to throw it out of. And I know that. And I hear her talking on the phone about to, talking to a friend, talking about selling her car for $9,000. And I say, when she gets off the phone, I say, if you don't sell me your car for 1000 you don't have a job tomorrow. Obviously, I'm using my leverage, forcing her to make a decision against her will. And that's just a very simple example of duress. Uh, moving down the page there. There cannot be anything illegal. Uh, everything has to be legal. So if anything agreed upon, and you know, when you get into building and contracting and zoning, and it's easy to break a law. It's easy to suggest you're going to build something that you can't, and therefore it voids the contract. And then you have to have legal competent parties. I don't want you to get comfortable with legally competent. What I want you to do is look at that first sentence and highlight the two words, legal capacity, legal capacity, because that's what you'll hear from here throughout the rest of the course. Legal capacity means two things. First of all, it means you're legally competent and being legally competent means two things. You're of contractual age and you're of sound mind. And I, I have a feeling you knew that coming into the classroom. You are of legal age and you are of sound mind. So, you know, they'll have scenarios in the form of questions. And uh, one of these ingredients will be askew, you know, in the scenario. And they want to see if you pick up on that and see why this particular contract perhaps is void or voidable. So here we are in the middle of page 191. And we're talking about the validity of a contract. I really don't like the way they expect us to know a lot of this and for me to teach it because this is almost law school stuff and we're certainly not preparing to be attorneys. But, you know, there's many kinds of contracts in contract world. First of all, let's reestablish the fact to ourselves that there's two kinds of law. There's criminal law and there's civil law. Criminal law is when me and you break a law, you know, assault, theft, armed robbery, whatever, and the state prosecutes us. Civil law is when there is a wrong committed, but it's, there's not a statute that addresses the wrong. If Walmart has had a leak for three months and they've been negligent in getting it repaired, and it, there's a drip of water that comes down about every six inches, about every six seconds, rather. And my old lady slips up, and now she's got a bad back for the rest of her life. 
how could you have a law on the books that says you're not allowed to have a pot, a puddle under your floor for three months? Yeah, it's silly, but it's a wrong nonetheless. So civil court is to iron out wrongs where one party is damaged as a result of the actions of the other. It, maybe I'm an inventor and you're infringing on a patent of mine, uh, etc. So contracts are obviously pursued in a civil court of law. You have not broken a crime uh, if you have breached a contract. So in the context of enforceability, this is what the second half of page 191 is. In the context of enforceability, because guys, not all civil disagreements can be brought into a court of law. If that were true, it would be Jerry Springer every single day at the courthouse. Legitimate beefs would not be able to be ironed out for all the trivial stuff. So the law categorizes contracts and assesses a set, a set of rules of enforceability for each category, if you will. So if I have a civil dispute with someone and I'm wanting to bring it into a civil court of law, I've got to meet the criteria. So here we are. We begin. We'll pull up the whiteboard. Uh, okay. You got your valid. You got your void. You got your voidable. And then you got your uh, unenforceable. Man, it's hard to write with a mouse. So valid and void, guys, don't waste your ink. There's not a lot of notes for you to take. Valid and void just has to do is if the recipe is complete or not. We just went over the recipe. So if the recipe has all of the legal requirements, it's a valid contract. If it's missing one or more of those ingredients we went over, it's void. So really, again, recipe, that's all, full or not. So void of bull, there are five instances where the courts deem and a particular agreements can be void of bull at the option of the aggrieved party. You know, anytime you're reading legal jargon, and they refer to someone as the aggrieved party. That's six, Mark. Uh, that's the person with some beef. I got a grievance. I'm the one that's been wronged. Uh, and two of these five I hear are on the exam right now. The first one is if a minor is involved. Now, I don't know if you're pausing on that in your mind, but I did as a student. Because I'll be damned if they didn't say you had to be of legal age to have a valid contract, right? And then when I was a student like you learning, now they're saying if a minor's involved, the contract's void of ball. I haven't found out why this contradiction exists. But as a student, when I try to learn stuff, I try to look back into how real life, because all this is a result of real life. And I'm thinking this. Maybe I enter an arrangement with a young person, not confirming their age. Maybe they lie to me, or I just presume wrongly. Nevertheless, they end up not meeting their end of the bargain. So I pursue them in a court of uh, law. And now they're pulling their driver's license out and showing the judge in the court. And the judge is like, oh, ho, Mr. Yarber, we got us a minor on our hands. And the judge would look at the minor and say, minor, you're free to leave this courtroom. There'll be no damages against you. Or if you feel froggy, you can force the adult to follow through with the arrangement y'all have. It is voidable at the option of the aggrieved party. I don't know if the law would echo what I just said. That's me being a student like you trying to make sense out of things that sometimes contradict each other. The second reason would be misrepresentation. Pardon me for not writing that word. That's the longest word in the alphabet, I think. Go ahead, write it out. Challenge me. You're still writing. You're not through. 
it's like 85 letters in that word. But, but, you know, that's the most easy of all to understand. I relied on a fact or a set of facts in order to enter this arrangement. Subsequently, I discovered that those facts were misrepresented to me. And, you know, sometimes some of those misrepresented facts are important, like school zone. You think school zone's important to a lot of folks? Yeah. You know, school zone's just as important to folks without kids as it is folks with kids? Because when you live in a hot school zone, your property's up here and you can sell it like that. So, but you put me in a damn house 67 feet outside of the school zone I asked you to put me in. That's enough for me to uh, back up, start over. So minor misrepresentation. Alcohol. I don't know how country all y'all are. My family's Beverly Hillbillies. And that's what they said. Yo, your damn uncle's high on the alcohol. But I'm hearing that's on the exam. You see, you know what's funny, and you'll agree with me, you know what a lot of business people do business over? Cocktails. So if somebody I entered an arrangement with falls through, but the only witness I got is a bartender, I might have a problem enforcing that agreement. But from what I understand from students, there's an Alki Hall scenario on the exam. Uh, this one is, I hear is on the exam, temporarily not of sound mind. Because, see, guys, you can be not of sound mind clinically, or you can be temporarily not of sound mind. You know, guys, I always use this tragic example because it is tragic. Saran Stacy used to play football for Alabama 20 years ago. 15 years ago, his wife and four kids were T-boned at an intersection in Enterprise, Alabama, and his wife and three kids were killed instantly and his fourth barely hung on oh my god so what I'm trying to tell you is if I lost my wife and three kids instantaneously pardon me if I'm out of my damn mind for a minute or two in a fog let's say and when I come out of that fog I might look back at some legal things I agreed to while I was in the fog and the law has said I got a right to question them. and I think you would probably agree rightfully so now, that's a very tragic example. It could be because I got the cancer. You know, I'm on heavy meds, on the radiation, I'm on the chemo, I'm not thinking clearly. Um, from what I understand, there is a question on the exam right now where there's a temporarily not of sound mind scenario. The last one of the voidable is duress. If one of the parties can prove duress, if they were not genuinely willing. Okay, the last one, unenforceable. There are two reasons an agreement could be deemed unenforceable. The first one is the statute of fraud. Okay, the, again, I'm not an attorney and I don't, I know enough about the law to get me in trouble, so I don't want to sound like I know more than I do. But there, again, there are particular rules that apply to the enforceability of contracts. And there, that is the particular rule of the statute of frauds. In the context it has over real estate contracts, which are unique in contract world, is that, is, is, I'm going to country it up, make it easy for you to remember, because you've got to remember it. If it ain't in writing, it ain't enforceable. That is not true of all contracts. I gave you an example of a personal property over the truck, handshake in the backyard. That was verbal and enforceable, but real estate contracts, 
if it ain't in writing, it ain't enforceable. So that is why maybe it was a verbal agreement. Well, if it's a verbal contract for real estate, per the statute of fraud, it is unenforceable. Y'all are thinking this is some high level. Yeah. I think it's way too high than it should be, frankly. I, they don't even need us to be delving into this. From what I understand from students, there's like three scenarios. And at the end, they're like, is the salesperson liable here? Oh, my God. I've read it. It's so vague and ambiguous. So we finished that. Again, these are the four rules of enforceability as far as contracts. So we're going to move on. Over here on page 192, discharge of contracts. First of all, that sounds kind of gross. But how can a contract go away? Well, okay. Again, you know, every contract's unique. There's contracts for purchases of products or service agreements. But one thing in a real estate contract that the purchaser is going to put in the offer, it is a blank field, it is a negotiable item, is the intended day of closing. So I, the purchaser, filling out the offer, and I come down to that, and I say, hey, you know, look at my calendar, look at my, September 29th. Does the law require that contract to close on September 29th? It does not. Because September 29th is a target. And you know what you do at a target? You shoot at it and hope to hit the bullseye. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes you come close to the bullseye. And frankly, you will discover soon after getting in the business, rarely does a purchase agreement close on the original intended target date. And the reason why is there's so many players involved in the transaction, the surveyor, the home inspector, the homeowner's insurance, the title folks, the closing attorney. Somebody's going to drop the ball. The deal gets postponed a day or two or three or four. Sometimes it'll get postponed two or three times if there's repairs and stuff. Um, but, you know, you got to start. There's an alpha and omega. So you start off with a target date. But guys, occasionally it is important to one or both parties that by gosh, we close by midnight of a certain day. Who knows the timing of the scenarios in a given set of circumstances, but sometimes one or both parties have to close. So I may feel the need in contractual writing to hold their feet to the fire. If so, when I put, I intend to close on September 29th, I must add the five words with time being of the essence. The minute I add with time being of the essence, now I'm holding their feet to the fire. And if they're the reason the deal don't close on the target date, then I can sue you for breach of contract. The guys in post license, we talk about the practicality of all this. This is just theory. Uh, you know, you could do a tracheotomy if you learned how, but in real life, are you going to do one? Probably not. So you're not going to use time as of the essence. You're really not. You may on an offer, but you're not on a purchase agreement. At the bottom of the page, assignment. And first of all, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you at the top of page 193, novation. Assignment, novation are first cousins of each other. The first sentence of assignment does, you know, the first sentence always does a good job of defining. An assignment refers to a transfer of rights or duties under a contract. Sometimes you'll read, the nerds will say, it's a transfer of all privileges and obligations uh, from one to another. So my example, let's say I'm a brand new landscaper. I'm a young buck, just got my truck. Just got my trailer, got my blower, got my weed eater, got my zero turn, got all my stuff. And I'm out there hustling up some business. And shoot, my first business man that owns 13 Taco Bells in Birmingham. He hires me and every Saturday and Sunday, I'm going to go to his Taco Bells and lop the hedges and cut the little bit of grass, blow the parking lot. So I signed a three-year contract with him, but a year and a half in it, I'm home uh, touching up some paint on the house because the old lady's been getting on my nerves about it. And I fall off the ladder and hurt my back. And the doctor says, Mark, you can no longer do labor for work. 
So I call my ta- uh, my Taco Bell owner guy and I s- tell him about my accident and I say, I got to get out of this. But my buddy Petey, he just started a landscaping business. We grew up together. He's honest as the day long. He's a hustler. He'll step into my shoes that I'm going to step out of and fulfill the remainder of this agreement. Are you okay with that? He says, Mark, man, if you refer him, yeah, because you did a bang up job. So, boom, I just described an assignment. I stepped out of a pair of legally obligated shoes. Petey stepped in them and followed through with the arrangement. No term changed, just the feet and the shoes. The pain in the neck about an assignment is the bottom of the page, not the last sentence, but the eight words before the last sentence. I want you to highlight the original party remains liable unless specifically released. The original party remains liable unless specifically released. So if I'm not specifically released and Petey drops the damn ball, you know, during the remainder of the agreement, you know, goes on a drinking binge. Uh, if the Taco Bell is going to sue Petey, and if they can't squeeze any blood out of Petey's turnip, they're going to come hunt me down and see if they can squeeze some blood out of my turnip. I am hanging out there like a sore thumb. I am still secondarily liable. Top of page 193, assignments, first cousin, novation. Let's go back to the same scenario, the landscaper, the 13 Taco Bells. I told you that the 13 Taco Bell owner was my first contract. I'm eager. I'm eager beaver. You know what eager beavers in the business world do mistakenly? Give their damn business away. Trying to get it. They're desperate. I'll do it half what they do it. So after a year of working for the Taco Bell guy, he calls for a meeting. He said, will you meet me for a cup of coffee at Taco Bell number seven? And so they meet for a cup of coffee and he goes, you know, you were my first client and I underpriced my services. I'm starving. I got a baby. I can't afford to raise my family. And the Taco Bell owner says, I knew damn well you underpriced yourself. That's why I signed it before you could get up. He said, but you, you know, you're a hustler. You're a young buck. You, you're doing well for me. I would definitely change my terms. I knew I've been getting over on you, Mark. I knew it was probably a matter of time. So we take our agreement and we change the compensation arrangement. That is novation. Read the, first of all, always highlight the first sentence. Substitution of a new contract for an existing contract is called novation. According to the law, gang, when you go into an ongoing existing agreement and you change a term, According to the law, you have tore up that agreement and are now substituting in its place a brand new agreement. Do you know what Nova is in Latin? New. Write that shit down. Pardon my French. I'm sorry. I've been drinking. Nova means new. That might be the clue. You know, you might remember it because of that. But do you see how novation and an assignment are similar yet different? There could be a substitution of parties as well as an additional compensation arrangement. Maybe Petey is going to fill my shoes, but Petey says, Mark, I ain't working for what you was working for. He's going to have to pay me a little more. And the man's agreeable to that. So that would be where the parties are substituted and a term was changed. But I'm just saying in novation, you know, it doesn't require a substitution of parties. If you just change a term, it's novation. So assignment, novation, related, similar, yet different. Page 193, middle of the page, breach of contract. I, I have a feeling you have an understanding of what breach of contract is. So in a breach of contract, the other party is said by the courts to be legally injured. And the courts provide the legally injured a legal rent. I don't know why I do that. It reminds me of a story, y'all. My father, when I was younger, in my 20s, he saw people doing that. And somebody told him wrong. They said, you do that when you're mad. So for years, we didn't want to tell him my father was mean. So get your ass down there and clean that basement, boy. <laughs> he would always do the 
quotes when he was mad. He didn't know. He didn't know. Point is, you know, if I fall down on the concrete sidewalk and I have a real injury, there's a real remedy for my injury. And that may be some back team, a Band-Aid, some cream. Well, if you breach our agreement, I'm legally injured. And the courts have provided the legally injured person a legal remedy for their injury. Uh, it is a suit for damages. You know that. Okay? That's my remedy. I can pursue you for damages. But again, I've already made the point that real estate contracts are very unique in contract world for many reasons. And the main reason is it's a big ticket item and it's permanent. So the ownership and the legitimate, uh, the legitimization of all the, the record keeping is stronger with real estate than anything else. So if you're a legally injured party in a real estate contract, you're actually provided two remedies for default. The first one is a suit for damages. And I want you to highlight it. It's right in the middle of the page. The second one is a suit for specific performance. You're going to need to know this. What's that mean, Mr. Mark? Well, let's say I see a home for sale. I make an offer on it. The woman who owns it accepts the offer. So we set a closing to take place in 30 days. Two weeks into the 30 days, the woman owner calls me up. Mr. Yarbrough, I have made a mistake. I should not be selling this property to you. Uh, I was the apple of my grandfather's eye. All my first cousins hate me. And he left his property to me. And it's been in our family for three generations. And my family has now found out I'm under contract to sell it. And they are threatening to disown me. I need to get out. I say, sorry. She goes, did you not hear my damn story? I heard your story. She goes, oh, you're, you're playing hardball, huh? She goes, well, I'm a woman of well means, Mr. Yarmer. I have other properties that are better than this one. Would you take another property that is twice as good? I say, mm -mm. she goes, wow, you're playing chicken with me. She goes, I told you I'm a woman of well means. Would you take X, X, X dollars in lieu of buying my home? I said, no, ma'am. She goes, why are you playing so hard with me? I said, because my mother's 96 years old and she lives next door to your home. And the reason I'm buying your damn home is so I can be right beside her because she's in a position in life. I have to take care of her. What are the three most important factors of real estate? So now do you see why the courts provide a legally injured person in real estate a suit for specific performance? I don't want your damn money. I need that property because of where it is. All right. Now, the come down two paragraphs and highlight the uh, first two sentences. It begins, the contract may limit the remedies available to the parties. That Read the, highlight that sentence in the next one. We're approaching our first break in case you're getting anxious. So here's the thing, guys. Let's say you're brand new in the business. You get a listing. Got a sign in it. You're proud. And son of a gun, you get up one morning and you check your email and you've got an offer. Somebody showed it last night. Emailed you an offer. So you print the offer off, you go to your seller's house, you sit at the kitchen table, you drink a glass of wine, and they're so proud of you. And they, uh, they accept the offer. So you got a contract. Well, you set a closing date for 30 days. One week into the 30 days, the buyer's agent calls you and says, Mark, I wish I wasn't having to make this call, but my buyers are fickle. My God, they're fickle. They fell in madly in love with every other house that showed up. So as soon as we got under contract with you, I told them, stop looking. They didn't. They got out this weekend and found something they like better. They want out. I say, I knew it was too good to be true. I said, let me go talk to my sellers. I'll get back with you in the morning. So I go talk to my sellers and I say, listen, the buyers are fickle. They found something they want better. They want out. 
But before you get all upset, don't you worry. I just graduated. Mr. Mark told me you can sue them for damages or you can sue them for specific purpose. And they look at me and they say, Mark, you see that one car in the driveway? I say, yeah. They say, we used to have three cars till my daughter wrecked one and the transmission went out in the other. So me and my husband both work in two jobs with one car and our kids are in every damn club at the school. We ain't got time to eat three squares, let alone sue somebody. You see where I'm heading with this? Litigation is not practical in residential real estate because we're red, white, and blue mamas and daddies. We're youngins. We live in real lives. We got that. And if I'm the seller and I'm going to sue the buyer for specific performance, do you know that that legal action could stay in the courts up to a year and a half? And what can I not do in that year and a half? Sell my damn house. You see how it's not practical? So as an industry, we invented earnest money. Now, guys, everybody listening to me understands the concept of a deposit. I put a deposit on a chalet up there in Gatlinburg. But the day before we supposed to leave, my daughter runs out in the neighborhood behind a car to fetch a ball and a car hits her. Now she's in emergency room and families flying in from all around the country. And the day after we supposed to be in Gatlinburg, I look at my wife and I say, I forgot to call and cancel. We lost the deposit. I ain't even going to call them and beg for it back. Why? Because that cost some money, didn't it? I understand the concept of a deposit. So take your understanding of a concept and let's apply it to earnest money. So from what I understand, talking to old timers, you know, earnest money came about in the 60s probably. So what we would do, if you can recall from our agency class, we only represented sellers back in the day. So if a buyer customer came forward wanting to write an offer on my listing, I would inform them. Now, listen, my seller has told me to inform any interested party. They will not consider an offer serious unless it has an earnest money deposit attached. And they say, oh, is that right? How much? You say, well, the law doesn't require earnest money. So since the law doesn't require it, there's no amount. I'm just telling you what my seller told me to tell you. Oh, I see. And then I say, and I want you to understand why you're pondering how much that you're not the only girl at the dance. That my seller very well may be considering two or three other offers. <laughs> Y'all are like, I'm just turn out. Do you see how I'm playing it as a salesperson, though? Because the larger amount they write, the less likely they are to walk. And that's really the purpose of earnest money, isn't it? And if they do walk, my buyer, my seller got some compensation. And usually the real estate company and the seller split the earnest money. So, uh, and you know, guys, a lot of times as a seller, if I've got three multiple offers sitting on my kitchen table that I'm sitting on, I got three multiple offers that I'm sitting on. Do you know more often than not, those three offering prices are very similar to each other? And do you know often what the distinguishing factor can be from those three offers? Earnest money. I'm going to slip some post license in on you just for the fun of it. Let's say I'm a buyer and I'm trying to get a property. It's listed for 150. So I got a $147,000 offer with a thousand dollars earnest money. Seller got a $146,000 offer with $500 earnest money. I slip up in there with 142 with $30,000 earnest money. Guess who's going to win that damn battle? And the beauty is I get my 30K back at the closing. <laughs> I beat better offers without having to pay a nickel to do so. So that's kind of the thinking when you're, you know, talking about earnest money. But let's read what you just highlighted. It will make more sense now. The contract may limit the remedies available to the parties. Earnest money, gang, I'm, I'm slipping in here. Earnest money is considered liquidated damages. In other words, if the... If the buyer walks and the seller goes, I'll take their thousand dollars earnest money, put it in my pocket, grumble a little bit and put the sign back up. Let's start over. What they're technically doing, according to the courts, is they are deciding that a thousand dollars is liquidating damages and they are choosing not to pursue you in a court of law. 
So now this liquidated damages might make more sense. A liquidated damage clause in a real estate purchase contract specifies the amount of money, that's the earnest money, to which the seller is entitled if the buyer breaches the contract. So basically, by putting earnest money up and adding the language, I am removing their right to sue me and reducing their remedy to the earnest money. Do you understand that? Turning the page. Y'all, how do you eat an elephant? One bite, at a time. One bite at a time. And that's what we're doing every night in this course. We're taking bites. But you know what? I'll be damned if they ain't big chewy bites. Yeah. So what is money exactly A deposit. A deposit. You remember that whole conversation <laughs> about the chalet? So, okay, let's go through it. In fact, I am at that stage. Uh, first of all, bottom of page 194. We're about to take our first break. Let's use of contract forms. Bottom of page 194. Guys, I may run into you at city stages. And uh, we exchange small talk, exchange pleasantries. And I say, uh, are you having a good weekend? And you're like, Mark, I wrote four contracts yesterday. I'm doing well. Thanks for asking. We say that a lot and we lie. We do not write contracts. Do you know who write contracts? Attorneys. Or the only people allowed to write contracts are one of the two parties involved in the actual agreement or an attorney, a non-attorney third party cannot write a contract. So it's a slang term we use. What we do is fill in the blanks on pre-printed contracts that have been provided us by our company. If you've ever heard of boilerplate agreements, boilerplate, a word for standard. So as you would imagine, gang, it is, am I at that point where I explain that? I'm not, so I'm not. So what I'm going to do before I open this can of warm up is we are going to take our first break. And when we come back, we'll be over here on page 195. Let's go ahead and take our break until. Uh, 7.09. Gives you a full 15 minutes. See y'all back here in a bit. Mm -hmm. Both of them here. 
and you feel it. Do you have to do what you can do in the place where you're going to be great? So, those questions that we have to do in the place are going to be over the place. Yeah, but the question that we have to do is that we have to do in the place.
Y'all ready to go home? So, this is a confirmation. Somebody just press on it and they would give me the option to forward it or copy it. So now it's just that. That's not as easy, though. I smell two cigarettes. I smell like a trash tray. All right, here we go. Let's get this over with. All right. Hopefully you're back from break. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We're at the bottom of page 195. So let's just kind of work through a scenario. I'm a person wanting to buy real estate. So I look around town, I find something I like, I write an offer, fill in all the blanks, I scratch out an earnest money check, paper clip it, <clears throat> my offer is presented to the seller. So when the seller receives an offer from an interested party, they got options, and well, let's go over their options, and uh, as I go over them, they're in no particular order. So I'm a seller, I got an interested party, and I have an offer, and I have the option of rejecting it. Uh, and it can be for practical reasons. Maybe between the time you wrote me an offer and sent it to me, I changed my mind, I don't want to sell my house. Well, maybe your son beat my son up at football practice. I ain't selling you my damn house. It doesn't have to be a practical reason. It could be petty. Um, but point is, is they have the option of rejecting your offer. They could accept your offer, changing nothing, putting signature at the end. They could let it sit on their kitchen table, figuratively speaking, for a few days. They're going to sit on it. Why would they sit on it? <laughs> Waiting for something better to come along, maybe, you know? Um... 
they could counter it. You know, they're like this, they're like, uh, well, we're asking five, you're writing a 465 offer, we'll counter back at 485. And so, I, you know, in the old days, manually, I would cross that out and put my initials. In the modern day, you have a cross out, but it's just a copy and paste function. You know, when you receive it, you don't like the price. You go down here in a little box, you write the price you want to counter offer, and you drag it, you drop it over what they had put. Um, now, understand this. When a seller decides to sit on an offer, you know, put it on the kitchen table, honey, let's, don't, let's wait a couple of days, we might get a better offer. Is the seller taking a risk? Yeah. Because the buyer could rescind the offer. Maybe they find something they like better. Maybe they decide they don't want to get involved in the market right now. And if it hadn't been accepted yet, if it's laying out there, I can pull it out from under you like a rug. I changed my mind. You know the old saying, bird in hand, better than two in bush. And there will be times that you advise your client. I don't think we need to sit on this. I think we need to counter or, you know, you're going to make advice. Uh, when they decide to counter, are they taking a risk? Yeah, because the minute they put pen to paper, figuratively speaking, anywhere other than signature, they have relieved the buyer of the obligation to buy the property. They had the power at that moment to sign and commit them but they chose to change something. They have relieved the buyer of any responsibility. In fact, the rules change now. According to the law, you tore their offer up and you know what you're doing? You're now making them an offer because now I, as the buyer, got the right to reject your counter offer, sit on your counter offer and make you sweat it out, counter your counter and keep the ball bouncing. So, yeah, they kind of discussed that over the next few pages. You know, you can turn to page 196. You know, down there where you see binder, um, I've only heard old timers talk about binders in residential real estate. A binder used to be an abbreviated purchase agreement, kind of like a one page summary. But in today's world, we're a litigious climate. People People feel the need to have a lot of protective language in their contracts. So all the contracts are four to six pages. So binders are really old hat. Um, you do see in italics letter of intent. That's what people in commercial real estate call an offer. So earnest money deposits, you see it discussed. We talked about it. Now over here on page 197, this is some weird stuff. Okay, I don't understand it. Guys, I have never practiced outside of the state of Alabama. They do stuff in other states, you know, grits, cream of wheat, you know, that's different than the way we do it. And some of it's weird. Read destruction. Okay, first of all, before I read this, in Alabama, and I assume this was true nationwide until I had to teach and I had to learn this. The, the seller, as you would imagine, y'all, has to maintain homeowners insurance protection from when they accept the offer through the closing. Doesn't that don't don't that just make sense? Apparently, not in some states. This just really blows my mind, but in some states, the buyer is responsible for the property while it's pending. It makes no damn sense to me. They don't even own it yet. So, on page 197, go to destruction of premises, and let's read together. In some states, once the sales contract is signed by both parties, the buyer assumes the risk of any damage to the property that could occur before the closing. And other states, laws and course decisions have placed the risk of loss on the sellers. I don't understand. But now that we've read that, Let's go to the paragraph above where it says equitable title. When a buyer signs a contract to purchase real estate that is accepted by the seller, the buyer does not immediately receive title to the land. We know that. That happens at the closing, right? It's be okay so far. Title transfers only upon delivery and acceptance of a deed. Yes, we're all in agreement. 
after both buyer and seller have executed a sales contract, however, the buyer acquires an interest in the land known as equitable title. A person who holds equitable title has rights that vary from state to state. But here's the sentence you're going to highlight. Equitable title gives the buyer an insurable interest in the property. So in those weird states where the buyer is responsible to protect the property from contract to closing, they invented this equitable title crap to suggest this now gives the buyer an insurable. It doesn't make sense. Just if you see equitable title, just remember this conversation. Correct. Now, you don't need to know that, but you are correct. We do not do that in Alabama. So on page 198, we're not going to go over that page, but those are all the provisions of a sales contract. You're welcome to read it while you're studying. It has what you would think it would have. Let's go up to the page 199, though, and let's do talk about some stuff. Contingencies. First sentence says conditions that must be satisfied before a sales contract is fully enforceable are contingencies. Yes, I'll go out with you if you take a shower. So that's my contingency. All right. So you see, not the first three bullets, but the second set of three bullets. These are the most common contingencies. The first bullet, the mortgage contingency. This protects the buyer's earnest money in the event that the buyer is unable to secure a mortgage on the property. So what if I make an offer on a property without the mortgage contingency? So I make the offer. Seller accepts. I go to the mortgage company. And the mortgage company runs my credit. And they say, we can't believe you even came in here and asked us to run your damn credit. My God, Mr. Yarber. You ain't going to get no financing on this. So I call my realtor up and I say, I can't get finance, and I guess I'm going to walk. And, and, the, and the buyer's like, no, you got a damn promise to buy their house. Do you got that much money? Do you got crap at your house you can sell? You made an agreement. You did not protect yourself and put a continue. You said this offer is contingent upon buyer's ability to acquire financing. So now you see how practical of a, let's call a contingency a back door. I need to get out of this deal if stuff don't work out the way I need it to. So the mortgage contingency. Uh, the, the inspection contingency has become the most common contingency. The inspection and the mortgage, the most common contingency. Now, during the summer, with the high demand for real estate, very few people came in with a home inspection contingency. Because when you're a seller, you know, beggars can't be choosers, right? I'm going to choose the one that comes in with the cleanest offer that makes, don't make me have to jump through hoops. So, you know, you want real estate, you don't come in there with no home inspection contingency. Are you taking a risk by buying a home without a home inspection contingency? Yeah, but sometimes beggars can't be choosers. But yeah, the language is this, this offer on this property is contingent upon buyer being satisfied with the result of a home inspection that will be performed within blank hours of acceptance. And then the next bullet is the booger of all contingencies. Always has been, always will be. The majority of people that own their home cannot buy another home until they sell this home. Two reasons. They can't qualify for the mortgage with the two mortgage payments is too heavy debt. Or they need the equity out of this property to put down on this property. So you write, this offer is contingent upon buyer's ability to sell their home. So I, the seller, accept that offer. And by accepting an offer, you know what that gives sellers permission to go do? Go look at houses. So they go find a home, they make an offer, and it's accepted. And then what does that make that seller feel comfortable to do? Go looking at homes. They go make an offer. It's accepted. That makes that seller feel comfortable. So now you've got a row of dominoes. If one fool in that row don't can't sell their home, 
then that entire row is going to continue standing. You can have one knucklehead screw up a whole ba 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 ba. Now, what I want you to look at the paragraph below the bullets. Highlight the first six words. The seller may insist on escape clause. In the left-hand margin, write break clause. And when I say break, like B-R-E-A-K, not A-K-E. B-R-E-A-K, break clause. I don't know if that's just an Alabama term, but that's what we call an escape clause in Alabama, a break clause. So I just kind of threw it at you in case they call it a break clause in the question. Here's what it is. You, is. I'm selling my home. You make me an offer. And this offer is contingent upon my ability to sell my home. So I accept your offer with that contingency, but I put a 72, the, the time is negotiable. I put a 72 hour uh, break clause. Basically what I'm telling the buyer. I will accept your offer with the booger of all contingencies, but I'm putting this break clause 72 hours, which means buyer, I'm going to continue dancing with interested parties. And if somebody else makes me an offer that I like better than yours, and it don't have to be better than theirs, I just have to like it better, then I'm going to call you and give you 72 hours to burp or get out the pot. And if you can't within 72 hours, I'm dancing with somebody else. So it's a fair way to address the booger of all contingencies. Bottom of the page, amendments and addendums. They are fraternal twins. The first sentence is worthy of being highlighted. A change or modification to the existing content of a co contract is an amendment. Now, look at the two words, amendments and addendums. Don't they kind of look similar? And when you say them, they kind of sound similar. So what I'm trying to tell you is on any question on the exam where one of those is the answer choices, they will both be offered as answer choices. So let's distinguish them. I don't want to talk about an amendment first, so we'll talk. turn the page. We'll talk about an addendum. Go ahead and highlight the first sentence. An addendum is any provision added to an existing contract. That may change or be an addition to the content of the original. So let's go back to the where I told you that we don't write contracts. We fill in the blanks on standard boilerplate agreements. So since they're standard, they're generic, which means it's more common than not that the buyer and seller want to address an issue in the negotiations that is not addressed in the standard preprint. I'll give you an example. There's a, a thousand reasons why a lot of times addendums are for uh, when r repairs and improvements are being negotiated. So you, you're going to make them do it with a license bonded and you know, blah, blah, blah. And you'll do that. But I had a student call me, this summer, they had just graduated and they were out mixing it up. And uh, he called me, he said, Mark, I got a deal. This happened all summer long. Um, seller, you know, sales were taking place in 24 hours. You know, put the sign up, they'd have 50 offers by midnight. Well, that didn't give the seller a time to go look at houses, make offers, negotiate, which happens in a normal market. So sellers were having to rent from the people they just sold their house to for a month, two, three, four months. So he called me up. He said, that's my situation. He said, can you help me word a rental agreement? I said, hell no. Um, that's your broker's job. Um, because you can word a rental agreement wrong and I'm, you know, I'm no attorney. So uh, what you do is you go to the copy machine, you get a blank piece of paper, you draw up the rent. Most real estate companies have a rental arrangement boilerplate, but I'm just saying for teaching purposes, I go get the piece of paper. I write out the separate agreement that's in addition to it's related. It's a separate agreement all by itself, 
but it's related to the primary agreement. Like I'll, I'll go out with you if you take a shower. They're two separate agreements, but they're related to each other. Uh, and according to the law, an addendum, that one page rental arrangement is a tiny contract in and of itself. Think of it as being the cowboy and the horse is the purchase agreement. This is a side agreement associated with the primary agreement, an addendum. So associate as a student, the word with negotiating. I would use an addendum to negotiate an item not addressed in the standard preprint. So it's turned back, backwards. No, ma'am. A counter offer is just where I receive your offer and I don't, I don't agree with everything that you've said. Yeah. But I want to make you an offer. I want to keep the negotiations going. You know, I'll, I'm not going to take that, but I'll take this, you know. So an amendment, again, they sound similar. They look similar. But an amendment is, says right there, a modification. It's a change to the initial agreement. What's up? An amendment to the Constitution. A change. So I like using the, certain examples. Um, my mother, God bless her, didn't have a pot to pee in or wanted to throw it out of, and I took care of her my whole adult life. And about 15 years ago, I was trying to buy her a condo here in Hoover, and some of y'all may know Four Seasons off Lorna Road. It's a cute older complex. They keep it up. They're very affordable. So me and Mama walk up in this one bedroom, and uh, gosh, they're so little. Look, 800 square feet. But we walk in the bedroom and there's this armoire. And I'm not talking about one you get at rooms to go and put a TV in. I'm talking about a European armoire, meaty, probably weighed 800 pounds, uh, probably 100 years old. You know, armoires, you, that's what was our closet. You put your clothes in your armoires. Well, it took my mother's breath away. She turned the corner. She was like, oh, my God. I can't imagine owning such a fine piece of furniture. I said, Mama, you want me to ask for it in the offer? She said, you can't do that. I said, quit telling me how to do my damn job, Mama. And I asked for it, and we got it. We set a closing day to take place about 30 days later. About a week after we had the contract, the husband called me up. He said, Mr. Yarbrough, I want to talk about that all more. I said, I was waiting on this call. He said, my wife has not stopped crying since we accepted that offer. It's been in her family for years. And the only reason she was willing to give it away is because we got to be in Nashville for my job. And I'm just calling you to see if we can have it back. I said, let me talk to my mama. And mama said, give it back to him, damn it. I'd want it back too. But I didn't just go into the agreement that we had and cross out where I had said seller to leave armoire and bedroom. Guys, once you have a contract, you might as well take a picture of every page because you're not going to put pen to paper anywhere. If you could, you better have damn good locks on the door because at night anybody could walk in the filing cabinets and put what they wanted to in purchase agreements. Well, how do you make the change, Mr. Mark? You go get a damn blank piece of paper from the copy machine. And you put on there, seller and buyer change their mind. Seller's not going to leave on war. Seller sign, mama sign. So I would do that with the addendum. Separate agreement, separate sheet of paper. Make it a part of the purchase agreement. I'm going to do the same thing with the amendment. I have a sneaky feeling you understand the gist of these, right? It's not rocket science. Uh, so I'm going to challenge you. I gave you the answer to the question I'm about to ask you earlier. Why do you think the majority of the time a contract is having to be amended? You'd be using a bunch of academic stuff. No, the closing date has to be changed. You remember when I said rarely does a contract close on the original intended day? So if the closing date changes, you've got to get a separate piece of paper. Closing has been rescheduled for September 30th. And you get buyer sign, seller sign. And if, if it's postponed again, i got to get another sheet of paper. Closing has been rescheduled to October the 3rd. you got to do it every time. 
Every time anything in the purchase agreement changes and the closing day is something in the agreement, you got to amend it. Turn to the page. Page 200. Options. Coincidentally, we talked about them earlier. Uh, guys, you do not have to have a real estate license to own property and sell someone an option to buy it. You do not have to have a real estate license to purchase an option to buy some property. And I've had a student tell me this is, I've had more than one student tell me this is a question, uh, something you need to know in the exam. On the third line below options, highlight the sentence that says the option E pays a fee as consideration for the option right. Let's say I'm at the Chamber of Commerce Thursday meet and greet. And I'm talking to Stu over in the corner. And Stu owns about 40 acres uh, of some property that I desire. So I say, Stu, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure I want to buy, but I got to get some things in order and check on some things before I commit. Will you take that property off the market for two weeks for me, pal? And I stick my hand out and he shakes it. We buddies. Two weeks later, I call him. I mean, before two weeks is up, I call him up. I say, I'm coming. I'll be over in a minute with an offer. He says, Mark. So I got to talking to my boys last night. They want to do something different with it. They don't want me to sell it. I'll be damned. We had a handshake. And I, I bet you at least five people saw us handshake over that. And I take him to court. And I even got witnesses. The judge is going to say, Mr. Yarber, I'm sorry, but a handshake doesn't make this enforceable. You have to have paid valuable consideration for this agreement to be enforceable in a court of law. So that's what you just highlighted. If we just shook hands, if I didn't pay monies or do something of value, then it's not enforceable in a court of law. So you can anticipate that. I'm almost done with y'all, y'all. We're taking a big bite tonight. Bottom of page 200. I don't know why I've had this heat on the whole time. I was going to turn it off. It's not cold in here anymore, is it? A little heat that does a good job. Okay, at the bottom of the page 200, owner financing contracts. We all understand what owner financing is. Sir, would you tote the note? So I'm an owner and you're wanting to buy my property and you're asking me, sir, would you owner finance? I say yes. So let me put on the whiteboard. I have options. There's a purchase money mortgage. I hope I got enough room. Purchase money mortgage. And then over here, I don't want to write them all down. I will. Land contract. There's four regional terms, guys. Unfortunately, like I told you, this is a national test. You've got to know all the regional terms. I'm going to read them all back to you. Give me a minute. Land contract, comma, contract for deed. There's four. I should have stacked them. Installment sale. And uh, bond for title. Let me see the word bond. Legalese don't use the word promise. 
covenant and bond or what legalese use a bond for title. All right. So you and your bride just got married and you come look at my house. I'm going to go back to the screen. Well, I'll let y'all write this down. Uh, and you say, Mr. Yard, but we're so young, you know, we haven't really established any credit. So we was wondering if you would be agreeable to owner financing. I say, yeah, first of all, let's understand that you can only owner finance if you outright own the property. If I'm still making payments on something, I can't owner finance. So as an owner willing to own a finance, I have two choices. I can do a purchase money mortgage or I can do a land contract contract for deed installment sale bond for title. Again, all those interchangeable regional terms. I will tell you more often than not, they'll use these two. That's why I put them up there first. More often than not, they'll call it a contract for deed or a land contract. So why the difference, Mr. Yarber? Well, hold on to your britches. First of all, any mortgage for the purpose of purchasing a property is called a purchase money mortgage. And I've had people go, well, duh, ain't all mortgages for that? No, some mortgages are for refinancing. So any mortgage for the purpose of purchasing is merely called a purchase money mortgage. So even though I'm not a fancy mortgage company, I'm just a knucklehead being asked to own a finance, I can take back a mortgage just like a brick and mortar mortgage company would. And then you're going to make monthly payments to me, whatever our terms are. And if you default on the agreement, meaning you breach, then I've got to foreclose on you just like a fancy mortgage company would. And one of the problems with foreclosure is, is it's costly and timely. Here are some other options of owner financing. Um, and there's no mortgage in, in any of these terms. You don't see the word mortgage. Why? Because there is no mortgage. It's owner financing without a mortgage. I'll give you an example. My nephew's name is... That's the school talking to a, a, a virtual student. But thanks for the heads up. What was I talking about? You're my nephew. My nephew's name's Hunter... Hunter about 35 now. This is about when he's about 24. And I was selling a car. I think I put it on Facebook. And he called me up. Uncle Mark, I want to buy that car from you. I said, Psh, write the check out to Uncle Mark. He said, well, that's kind of why I was calling. I was, one, I was going to see if you would own a finance. I said, Hunter, don't embarrass yourself and ask anybody <laughs> else that again. People do not own or finance cars. And the reason why is cars have wheels. <laughs> you can go away and never come back. <clears throat> so, and I, you know, psh, when you own or finance from a nephew, because, you know, my nephew then was like a, most young people, you know, not worth a damn. <laughs> But then, you know, as I'm talking to my nephew, I thought, this is my, my sister's boy, right? Maybe I cut him a break. I said, all right, Hunter. I said, I'm going to hold the title, but you're going to make payments to me, right? For so long, this much a month. And I said, I'm going to tell you what, if you're a day late on your payment, I'm going to call the cops and tell them it's stolen. <laughs> so if you get pulled over, put both hands out the window. Because <laughs> they ain't pulling you over for speed. But the point is, is what was I'm doing? I'm holding the title to the car hostage until you meet our finance arrangement. I'm holding this hostage. That's kind of the thinking here. You fulfill your promise to pay me monies. I will give you the title, you know, bond for title, uh, contract for deed. You fulfill the finance contract. I'll give you the damn deed. So two things that I want you to know about both of these for test purposes. Here, if the borrower defaults, then the owner would have to foreclose. We just said that, right? There's a mortgage. So I would have to foreclose. But now on the opposite side of the line, there's no mortgage. So I'm not going to foreclose. Well, what are you going to do, Mr. Yarber? You're going to evict. 
but that's what you do to tenants. No, just like you have been taught your whole life that a tenant is a renter, you've been taught your whole life you evict tenants, renters. Eviction is a legal procedure to eject someone from the property, and you can do so for a variety of reasons. It just happens to be more often than not for renters. So I'm, I'm going to foreclose here. I'm going to evict here. Now, guys, don't get me wrong. No matter which situation you're in, as the purchaser, I have all of the normal privileges and obligations of home ownership. Do I got to pay property taxes? If I won't protect it, do I got to have homeowners? Do I get tax consequences? Am I building equity? Yeah. It's just what happens at the end. Foreclose on one, evict on the other. And then right here, I want you to know that the purchaser throughout the loan has legal title. And we'll talk about that in a second. We're down here. The seller keeps title. Remember, I said he holds it hostage. Think of eviction. I mean, think of foreclosure. It's not this really, if there's any attorneys listening to me, but think of foreclosure as a way for the lender to reacquire legal title. You got it now. I want it back. Why? Because I got to sell it at a foreclosure sale and I can't sell something I ain't got the title to. Um, so you foreclose here, you evict here. Purchaser has legal title here. Seller has legal title here. Okay. Those are the only two things you need to know about those two owner financing situations. Are oh, you back back over here at the bottom of page 200? <clears throat> Something I forgot to tell you. Look at the last paragraph. And in the first two sentences, you see some of what I put up there. You see the contract for deed, bond for title, installment contract, land contract. Uh, but what I want you to write in the left-hand margin is vendor versus vendee. Vendor versus vendee. If you're ever reading a scenario type multiple choice question and the parties are identified as vendor or vendee, then that's an owner financing scenario. What do you call a seller of products sometimes? A vendor, right? So that's why the owner of the property would be the vendor. The purchaser would be the vendee. But anytime you see the parties identified as such, it's an owner financing situation. The thinking kind of here is, is this is microwave right here, and this is conventional oven, you know. Conventional oven takes longer. Microwave is a little short. It's cheaper and easier to evict than to foreclose. And, gang, 744, we're going to do our 15 minutes and get out of here at 8 o'clock. Mark got a headache. <laughs> this was a short chapter. I didn't make it short. Y'all may begin.
But yeah, I have an OCD issue. I have to take chairs half the table. They need to spend 10 minutes in here. Did y'all do that when y'all get it? It's terrible. All right, gang, we've had our 15 minutes, and, you know, there's two or three classes during the cycle where we're going to get out early. I don't feel the need to keep people from the families and from resting just for the fun of it. We've covered the material. I'm not compromising anything. Y'all go home, enjoy, rest, study. We'll see y'all again, satellite students. You're not going to see the webinar Tuesday night. You're going to come in. Your moderator is going to handle it. So it's a 100-question exam. Hold on. Here we go. Let's do some test-taking tips. Let me give you all a few test-taking tips. <clears throat> when you sit down to take the exam, you want to pretend you got a metronome in front of you because you want to maintain a pace and you want to spend the same amount of time on each question. And here's how you do that. You'll read each question twice before you even glance at the answer choices. And you will read the answer choices twice. Usually, as you're reading the answer choices, your gut has a good feeling about what the answer is. If, your answer, if you hear your brain go, B, put it, don't question it, and move on. See, what a lot of people will go, I think I heard B, but I'm going to read it four more times and talk my damn self out of B. And how many times have we ever heard our gut is usually correct? And who are bad at taking multiple choice exams? People that overanalyze. So you read the question twice, read the answer choices twice, put the answer if it's there. If you can't come up with an answer in about 10 seconds, and don't count the 10, then you skip the question and you continue on. Remember, we got the, you can't labor over a question. When you come to a math question, simply because of the time it takes, I don't care if you're a mathematician, you skip it and continue. When you get to 100, you pop your knuckles, you take a deep breath, and you go back and do your checkmarked questions with the math ones being the last ones. And guys, I want to tell you right now, you're going to start the exam at 6 p.m. If you follow my instructions, you will be done between 8 and 8.30. I have people who take the state exam. You get three and a half hours. And they say, Mr. Yard, I took all three and a half hours. I'm like, what do you want, a damn cookie? It sounds on paper like that's good, like you're being a good student. But you know what? You've been in there three and a half hours. It tells me you've been working every damn question in your mind. That's what you've been doing. Multiple choice exams, guys, it's a challenge. It's really, there's an art to taking it. You got to walk in mad. You can't walk in intimidated, worried, and scared. That affects your performance, five to six, seven points. So get mad at it. <clears throat> but nevertheless, have a good weekend, get some sleep, do some studying. We'll see y'all six o'clock. I'll see satellite students Wednesday night, six o'clock. See y'all then. Uh, for all the people chatting, you need to handle this with admin and not me. You should be made, being made aware of all of these uh, questions and the answers to them.